Great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Great Awakening Generator. I am Rose McNair, and you see me a lot of times, but today I'm here to introduce you to two wonderful, wonderful ladies who are starting a new series on the Great Awakening Generator, Generator, for which we do not have a name just yet. And we understand that you'll understand that the name is going to evolve. Okay, so I'm introducing once again on the Great Awakening Generator, Kirsty Denny and <laughs> Soraya Adedahim. I said the name right, I hope. <laughs> yes, well, hello, ladies, and welcome. Hi, thank you for having us here. Yeah, Wonderful. so good to be okay. here. Right, so we're going to get straight on to it because I'm going to go away whilst you carry on talking about your first episode of this new series, right? Mm -hmm. I and so what we're doing is tell us tell us Kirsty what is it about yeah so we're going to have a whole series of conversations and discussions um centered around neurodivergence neurodiversity um what is it what does it mean what does it mean to different people looking at it from different perspectives and breaking it down as well into into different topics because we have a lot to talk about um, and we really welcome <laughs> discussion, different points of view, and just really opening up that conversation. Um, Great. Yeah, so it's going to be lots of fun. And so uh, me and Soraya will have quite a few conversations, and then hopefully we'll be inviting some other people in as well. Mm -hmm. mm. So hearing that you're going to have conversations, so there's discussions, but the discussions are perhaps with the two of you sometimes it might be just you Kirsty that's that's going to like host something uh it, like a uh what was the word I used here on screen time only with you but there'll be other times where you and Soraya will be discussing it Soraya will be discussing it and then you will also have group discussions on the mm. channel right yeah. Absolutely wonderful. So, and all as in all ways, we, we're going to be covering all aspect, aspects of neurodivergence as you already know them and anything new that comes up, right? Yeah, I'm sure it yeah. will evolve kind of organically. Yeah. Right. Okay. Why mm. are we doing it? Why are we creating um, uh, this, this um, series on the Great Awakening Generator? I mean, I could say, but can you say, it, please? <laughs> Um, I think it's time. I think, um, you know, there's always been neurodivergent people, but there's a growing awareness. Um, there's a kind of awakening of the, the community. More and more people are realizing, hey, that might be me. So that's, that's one right. on its own, a really great uh, sort of reason to have these conversations. Yes. If people are thinking, gosh, I have some of those traits and characteristics and they're wondering you know am Absolutely. I neurodivergent are my children um what does it mean is it a disorder is it a superpower is it something in between is it all of the above um mm -hmm. and you know and there's lots of controversy sometimes around the topic so it's really good to just look at it and say you know there's this opinion and there's that opinion mm. There might be some truth in lots of different perspectives and also what are the kind of lived experiences of people who may or may not have diagnoses but they feel they fall under under these kind of broad categories um, because they are quite broad mm. <clears throat> yes yeah. they certainly are so um yeah i'm glad i, I and thank you for explaining it like that so soraya please tell us something about yourself briefly, because I know that Kirsty is going to do an in-depth introduction. And tell and tell me a little bit about why you uh, decided to support this. Mm. Yeah, so um, I was diagnosed um, both ADHD and autism um, just over a year ago now. And for me, it was life changing. Actually, I would say that it was life saving. <laughs> um, I, I, I personally really needed that diagnosis to feel 
so much more validated in why my life had been the way it had been and why people had been the way that they had been towards me and I couldn't quite understand why. So it really, really, really helped me to just, yeah, be able to realize that it's not, it's not about me, like it's not, you know, it's not, I'm not the failure, I'm not the issue, you know, per se, as I always kind of thought I was. Um, so yeah, it was, it was super important for me. And I guess because I'm neurodivergent and I tend to get really passionate about things and that, that, that means something to me, this is something that means something to me because of my lived experience and how through my lived experience and newfound understanding of myself, it's also helped me to, well, it's not helped me, but it's, it's made me look deeper into the subject at large and to, and to speak with other neurodivergent people and to hear their stories and, you know, to kind of all put it together in my mind and to, to, to really, you know, realize that, yeah, we are all so unique, but then there might be certain elements or aspects of our stories that are quite similar or, you know, certain parts of it that we share. And I think that um, a really common thing that I seem to have come across is that we often feel so misunderstood in this world or so different or, you know, and I just think that, mm -hmm. um, that for a lot of people, not everyone, and I guess it depends on their upbringing and, the, and you know, many, many other things. But um, for a lot of people, that seems to come with a negative belief as opposed to a positive one. And I think that that could be changed into a positive one if we all had a greater understanding of ourselves and if the world at large had a greater understanding of us. Yeah, exactly. So, ladies, thank you so much for doing this Kirsty you were such an amazing person in the times that we did all those interviews and we suddenly started to realize or I started to realize we needed to have a platform and one of the reasons we wanted to do it on the Great Awakening Generator was because that was the medium of of, of awareness that, that I had or we had at the time so thank you so much for agreeing to do this and Soraya thank you so much for coming along and saying yeah I'll get on board with that because I felt too that this was an important aspect that these people that have been um, labeled from the alphabet soup that we needed to know more about what that was and that was okay to have them, that they've come, all of you have come to make a huge difference here on this planet. And so I'm honored that you agreed to do it and, mm. and to bring this aspect to the Great Awakening Generator because it means that, you know, where you thought, Nobody understands. Now you're creating the platform to give understanding to people. And that is part of the awakening in this aspect, especially. So I'm eternally grateful to the two of you for putting yourselves up there. And, um, you know, uh, I'm just looking forward to what's going to come through with this and just creating that awareness. This is such a profound moment uh, that this is happening. And so I'm just going to say thank you again and so much for just doing it and being open to it and i'm just going to enjoy what's coming out and <laughs> to anybody that's watching if you have any comments and uh, if you're feeling like you know what kirsty and soraya are talking about is really something you resonate with please comment please like because this is encouragement for us to know that we're reaching everybody that we need to be reached at this time so mm. thank you so much ladies i'm gonna go away now and let yeah, you go well, on the recording <laughs> thank yeah Thanks, thank you Rose. so much for the invitation and for the opening um yeah we you're very appreciate welcome. it appreciate yeah. it very much yeah, yeah. and you're the encouragement mm. thank you thank you this is, this is what i'm here for i came to do this yeah. and you Yay. came to do that so, <laughs> so exciting <laughs> wonderful so thank you so much I'm Thank you, Rose. Thank you. I'll say goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Everybody, please stay tuned because they're going to continue having a chat. <laughs> <laughs> and who knows where that will go? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> only, only to good and to good and those places. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, Rose. Bye. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. So here we are. <laughs> Yay! Finally. Ready this to go on exciting. some some wild tangents. 
Um, we really can. Um, and I'm just so happy that we're here doing this, you know, from meeting you, however, a couple of months ago, mm. um, to talking about this, to being here and doing it. I'm I'm really excited and happy. Yeah, it's fun. Um, and so we'll start with, well, obviously we'll just chat, but we'll start with you. And you've already said how you, um, you do have, you know, an official diagnosis um, and that it's incredibly valuable for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd really love to hear to the extent, obviously, that you're comfortable sharing what prompted you to pursue that or, you know, what was the precursor to that? So how did you, mm. kind of, how did you become aware or interested in neurodivergence and then think, hey, maybe that's me? Yeah. <laughs> so I I kind of grew up my my auntie um has ADHD or is ADHD and um she was very much the kind of hyperactive profile so it was kind of more (laughs) obvious in that in that sense and um you know I I I love her to bits we get along really well and she's you know amazing (laughs) but um yeah I kind of always looked at her and but then I would question myself and be like, you know, because I kind of always thought, I kind of feel like I've got ADHD because of da da da, you know, all these different reasons why I thought that I had it. But then I would look at her and I'd be like, oh, but I'm not, I'm not that hyperactive. And she'd been diagnosed from a young age since she was a child, you know, so it was, as I say, more obvious. Um, and so I would always just invalidate myself because I'd be like, well, no, I can't be ADHD because when I look at her, like I'm not, I'm not hyperactive like that. Like I can be like, I can be like really excitable and you know, all of that, but depending on the crowds and depending on the mood, like it was just Mm. different. So I never really did anything with it, but, um, you know, went through life struggling. (laughs) Um, (laughs) and then I kind of always just, I, I got to a point in my life, maybe a few years, five years or so ago. And I just kind of thought, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely ADHD, but, um, but I just thought, ah, oh, I'm not really bothered to get diagnosed. Like it didn't, I, I wasn't really bothered about getting diagnosed at that point. Um, and then I went, um, to visit family back in England and actually, um, uh, my auntie, um, about two years ago now. And, her husband, um, we were we were sitting down ha- having a conversation, um, a little get together. Hadn't seen each other for quite some time, and and her husband brought up the fact that um, he's recently learnt that he's autistic, and I was just so taken aback by that because honestly, back then, two years ago, it's crazy to think how far I've come with my understanding <laughs> of autism now. But yeah. back then, two years ago, I honestly had this really. Uh, uneducated um sort of stereotypical view stereotypical opinion of what I thought autism was and I really thought that autism had a look to it and you could tell if somebody was autistic and all of that kind of stuff so when he told Mm -hmm. me that like that obviously sparked my interest because I looked at him and I was like well I never would have guessed that he's autistic but Mm -hmm. you know he shared his story and I and I got really curious about that and the more he was sharing the more I was like well, hold on a minute, you know, because I really (laughs) resonate with a lot of what you're saying. And so that evening I decided to go away and just do a little bit of research online. And I came across this, um, this, uh, it's it's called the unofficial checklist for autism in in females or something like that. And I was Mm. reading this checklist and I was just like, oh my (laughs) gosh. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Like almost every single tick of like, out of like I don't even know how many traits but a lot of different traits and I was just like wow like this is definitely me and yeah and I just the next day I remember sitting on the couch next to my mum and I was like mum I think I'm autistic and she was like well why do you think that and I just presented her with this unofficial checklist and she was (laughs) like oh wow okay yeah (laughs) I see that (laughs) um and then interestingly enough so my mum and dad aren't together anymore but a couple of days after that I went and traveled up to London to go and see my dad and I was with my son who was undiagnosed at the time but he's now diagnosed too um Mm. and we were just at the playground and my son was just being my son um very very active and highly spirited and all of those kinds of things and my dad turns around and says you know I was exactly like that when I was a boy and um, (laughs) says I'm pretty sure I'm autistic and I was like 
what makes you think that dad and he goes well um he's a taxi driver in london and he goes well i take autistic children to school and 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 i had to go on to this course this autism awareness course because oh. i was taking autistic kids to school and he goes whilst i was at this course he was like i was thinking oh, no, <laughs> this is really me and so I, then like it was just so weird how all the all signs kept popping yeah. up yeah, yeah all at once and so i was like well okay i'm if my dad's autistic then mm-hmm. i guess there's a strong chance that i am too so um yeah and then I came back to New Zealand and um as I say it was a really crazy time in my life at that time um my mental health really wasn't that great um and I just thought yeah um uh, at this point I'd self-diagnosed and I and I and I didn't think that it was important like for me I didn't need a psychiatrist to tell me that I was I already knew that I was and I was I was 100% convinced of that but um there was that element of me that was like, well, if I want to be validated by my family and, you know, people that have really massively misunderstood me and scapegoated me and ostracized me and all of these other things, then I suppose having some kind of formal diagnosis would benefit that in some way. Um, That was my kind of thought process behind actually going to get a formal diagnosis. Um, and so, yeah, I did. And it was pretty easy. I mean, I wasn't surprised when, <laughs> when the psychiatrist turned around, I had two different ones for each, you know, ADHD and autism, but I wasn't surprised in the slightest when they both turned around and said, you know, that I was autistic and ADHD, because by that point I'd done so much research and I just knew. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's this really kind of cute, funny thing with, um, autistic and ADHD people that often, when we figure it out um you know that becomes our special interest for a time and we hyper focus yeah. on it and it's really uh, kind of ironic <laughs> I think it's like also another like pattern that I've noticed with autistic and ADHD people is like how a lot of us seem to have like interests in things like psychology and you know all of this kind of stuff and I'm like it makes so much sense because we go through our whole lives like trying to analyze people and situations because because you know because of our some people would call it social difficulties or Mm. deficits or whatever (laughs) people want to call it right but you know we just go through life like trying to figure things out and you know put the missing puzzle pieces together of things that don't make sense and so yeah I find it really interesting also that we tend to have these special interests and yeah and then when we Mm. get when we have the understanding of oh it's neuro we're neurodivergent it's like oh like I want to know the ins and outs of it all because I want to you know it just it helps to just honestly make sense of everything (laughs) Mm. Yeah. yeah yeah definitely And because, you know, we'll get into this a bit um, in terms of what were the signs when you were a child, but, you know, I was, I was, uh, some of my nicknames, you know, the silent one, the shy Mm. one. Mm -hmm. I remember, (laughs) I remember um, adults kind of surreptitiously or not, or not so surreptitiously being like, oh, she's just a bit clumsy. (laughs) Ah, (laughs) So, you know, maybe dyspraxic or um mm. those types of things yes. and then as I got older there'd be stuff like you know nerd weirdo space cadet that's one that I remember thinking like mm. that's kind of mean but also quite funny <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, kind of accurate like you know like floating off in the ether yes. um so yes it is interesting um mm. and so you know what are what are some of the top things the top traits because some people watching will know a lot about ADHD Mm. and autism and some won't but the ones that you think affect you the most on a daily basis perhaps yeah well the number one thing that I'm going to talk about right now is something that's actually really affecting me at the moment so it's it's right there in the forefront of my mind is OCD (laughs) um (laughs) and so I was formally diagnosed with OCD when I was 19 years old um Mm -hmm. so what uh 11 years ago now um and so this is way before obviously my autism diagnosis um Mm. and you know now through my autism diagnosis I've learned that it's really common for autistic people to have OCD um so it's interesting because when I got my OCD diagnosis at 19 years old um 
I remember the the therapist at the time talking to me and you know explaining to me what OCD was and um how it was manifesting for me and all of these things and I was just kind of thinking hold on a minute I've done this since I like I have done these things since I can remember like there's not a time in my life that I cannot remember doing these things, these compulsions and, you know, like it would be like, I, I'm not religious in any way, but I would pray reli- like religiously Rituals, like, every single yeah. night because I would think to myself, if I don't pray, something really bad is going to happen to me and my family. And I would do things like I would touch myself on on one leg and then I'd be like, oh my God, I've got to touch the same side in the same place. And if I don't, something really bad is going to happen. You know, everything has to be certain, like, you know, it, 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 it was just very much like that. But then mm-hmm. the more I learned about OCD and the different subtypes and then the older I got, I started having different subtypes of OCD. And that's when I got diagnosed because I guess back when I was a child, it was it wasn't so much of a of an issue um it didn't come with as much anxiety as it as it did later in life kind of thing but um but yeah it was something that I and so when I got my autism diagnosis I thought to myself that's why I've had these OCD things since I was a kid because in reality for me like I, I don't know if it's like I was I've been thinking in my head like I wonder if OCD is really like a mental health thing or is it just an autism thing because because I've had it from such a young age. So I don't know, that's a topic for another time. But um, mm. yeah, I find it really interesting. So yeah, OCD is a big one for me. Um, another one <laughs> I would say is like how crazily obsessed I would get about, um, you know, certain things like my my special interests. Like from a young age, I had a lot of different special interests like astrology and I would just like, research it for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and, hours and, hours and it would just consume me. There was this one particular band that I was absolutely obsessed with called Tokyo Hotel and there were this German pop rock band and I my room like that you could not see an inch of like paint on the wall because it was just covered with posters and I would sit like any time that I wasn't in school or you know with friends I would be on the computer watching their videos like just could not stop talking about them when I was at school it was all I would talk about everyone just knew me (laughs) as the girl who just won't shut up about Tokyo Hotel Mm. um and as I say they were a German band and I taught myself German like I (laughs) I taught myself German because I was so obsessed with this band and so and I was living in France at the time and we had the choice between learning Spanish and German in school and I obviously chose German and I was just getting straight A stars the whole way you know and um yeah like it was like pretty much one of the only subjects that I really excelled in because I was just so hyper focused and I loved it and I was consumed by it and um yeah so yeah, those, those, those things, but I'm also just sensitive to noises. Fireworks would be a real no for me. I remember, you know, mum taking me to see these fireworks and I was just like crying at the noise and like just hiding and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, and again, same as you, like the whole, like I was, I was always referred to as goody two shoes. Goody two shoes. I was so quiet as a little girl. My mum, yeah. my mum's had three children, and she would say that as a child, like I was the, the easiest one because I was just so quiet and compliant <laughs> and all of those things, and I just never made a fuss about anything. Um, that all changed when I hit teenage years, so that changed massively. But um, <laughs> yeah, definitely as a little girl, I was very much the quiet kind of really polite and sweet little girl you know (laughs) yeah that's yeah I was so quiet that I basically only spoke to my mum for quite a long time I don't really remember when that changed but oh yeah yeah and do you remember having any really close friends in childhood yes but I, I had kind of no friends until I was eight and then I made one friend um and she was my best friend and you know and <laughs> she may be watching hi um <laughs> I would say that she's probably you know new a virgin yeah <laughs> it's I funny wanna... because that's one of the things Everybody. that when I was 
<laughs> when I was learning about autism and then one of the things that it said was you know it's quite common for these kids to not really have many friends but if they do have a really close friend that friend tends to be neurodivergent and that was me growing up like my best friend Cammy she's more like a sister to be honest like she is not diagnosed but um she is has self-diagnosed as well she's um and I would say almost definitely autistic as well so yeah and we were just inseparable absolutely inseparable but yeah outside of Cami, I've, I've not really had any other <laughs> friends <laughs> so, interesting hey yeah and I would yeah and I had a kind of a small circle of friends in high school but we were kind of the the, the nerdy slightly odd ones we weren't really mm. you know outcasts but we we certainly weren't the popular kids yes, <laughs> yes. let's put it that way mm-hmm. yeah, yeah so. <laughs> a few quirks in there that's for sure <laughs> mm. it's so I find it so interesting and fascinating how we're just so drawn to each other um like you know neurodivergence with other neurodivergence um I was I was reading this uh, you know how there's like little memes and stuff that pop up on like social mm. media and stuff and there was like this one that popped up and it was like these two heads and it was like neurotypical and neurodivergent no neurodivergent and neurotypical and it says like neurodivergent person goes I'm autistic and then neurotypical person goes you don't look autistic or whatever and then it was like neurodivergent to neurodivergent I'm autistic and the other one goes I know Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) I've just been waiting for you to figure it out yeah um yeah and I'm like that I have quite a strong radar and (laughs) over the past because because I've been kind of following along here for a while because I started being interested in it um when my older boy was kind of a toddler and he's 10 now so um that's when I started really researching and um actually a a lot has changed since then in terms of awareness and the amount of information Mm -hmm. and the amount of people on YouTube and the amount of memes on Facebook (laughs) what have you and so all the time more of my friends are kind of going ah and I'm like (laughs) should I act surprised or do you like do you want me to act do you want me to act shocked or like (laughs) yeah this is why we're friends you know (laughs) um which is not to say that I'm not friends with neurotypical people and obviously you know you can have neurotypical people who are sensitive and quirky and there's it's pretty hard in my opinion to have like a hard cut off between like this person's neurotypical and this person's neurodivergent it's like mm. there's some sort of like a tipping point um but it is that like, you kind of you find your people you say... who, you're, who you're comfortable with and would you say that yeah. it's more like i i hear you and this is something that i'm really like you know observing at the moment and becoming really you know just doing the whole picking up on pattern things and stuff Mm -hmm. and and I and I hear you and yeah I guess it would be hard to like you know make it like that black and white but um I mean it is in terms of a diagnostic because there has to be some amount of traits or whatever at at which point you say yes you have a diagnosis Mm. um but in real life you know people are very complex Mm. Um, so mm. any kind of psychological diagnosis is has shades of gray right because um, yes yeah human beings are very complicated and we have a lot going on yeah Mm. but I think would you I think it would be it's like there are certain traits um and when you combine all of those traits for example Let's talk about things like creativity, sense of justice, honesty, black and white thinking, like all of these types of traits. When you all of those traits combined, if there are a lot of those types of traits, I think it's it's fair to say that this is when we're looking more towards an autism diagnosis as opposed to like quirky neurotypical. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. Yeah. But it's just not like a Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a system that we create as humans. So we create it yeah. and then we follow it how 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 we see fit um and so it's like if it's useful then that's Mm. amazing yeah but definitely you know in terms of people who I'm close with who I can easily talk with Mm. who I really enjoy spending time (laughs) with then most of them you know 
if they if they wanted to and they kind of researched themselves and looked at how they fit various boxes most of them probably could get a diagnosis although it is harder as an adult woman I think still if you want to yeah, get a diagnosis well, yes, because so... especially because we tend to be the best at, at masking mm. um yeah and so for me I don't think I will ever um pursue a diagnosis I just I just don't want to um and that's not to say that I don't think it's incredibly useful if you do want to and my children have diagnoses yeah yeah Mm. oh yeah yeah no I think I think you're right I think it really depends like each to their own on how how much a diagnosis means for me personally it's like I don't want to be limited by my diagnosis because I think like I've had a lot of you know of these types of discussions with a lot of different people and I've had some people say to me like why why is the diagnosis so important to you and why do you want that label and whatnot and personally and this is my belief I feel that labels shouldn't be necessary should not be necessary however I think that for some circumstances they are and that's just based on how uneducated society is around certain things and how having that label can help us and others to understand you know why or what or whatever so yeah I think that they shouldn't be necessary because in an ideal world mm. um everybody would just understand that there are different neurotypes and and different neurotypes you know do different things and that it's okay and mm. and just treat people with respect accordingly um and and be accepting of one another but unfortunately I think that we don't <laughs> live in a world like that although you know let's as we say there's a lot more awareness being created right now um mm -hmm. but but yeah we're still not there we're still not there. no I agree it's kind of like an interim measure because as a species you know we're evolving and we will I'm up I'm an optimist we'll evolve to the point mm. where you know we all kind of communicate energetically and heart to heart mm. and all the things that at the moment get so easily lost in translation you know the best one of the best examples is all the people flashing on um social media because they're just texting things and it's so impersonal and you lose the whole energy of an interaction um mm. you know it's like when we when we evolve with the ways that we communicate with each other um we won't have all those misunderstandings and yeah yeah so that's something to work towards definitely and that's what we're doing and that's why mm. that's why that's why we're here that's why I feel really passionate about it mm. yeah definitely um and so I'm just reflecting a little bit you know like I think I talked to Rose a little bit about this already maybe but you know when I look back on my childhood for example there's some pretty obvious signs of really high anxiety yeah. Um, and kind of sensory stress um, and things that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of as a, a stim or a something like that, you know, yeah. through the lens of what we know now, like, oh, yeah, I was always chewing something, maybe, mm. like either my hair or my sleeve or my nails um, yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah, and it was kind of getting like, stop it stop it and it's like well but I needed to release the stress somehow and yeah. I was really overwhelmed by smells mm. yet sound as well and um and this is interesting because you know your Sarai is doing sound healing training at the moment and I would just hum all the time mm. so when I was in the playground at school and stuff like that and I was often a bit stressed because there was that um, you know sometimes lunchtime was really more stressful than class time because I had to <laughs> try and like fit in and find something mm. to do and um, you know maybe my one friend or two friends that I had would be doing something that I was really yeah. uncomfortable with so I'd be like oh either I'm on my own or I do the thing I'm uncomfortable with but the humming like reflecting back on it it was I was just trying to regulate myself all so, the time yeah 
And it's a powerful thing, you know, to use the vibration of sound too. It really is. And yeah. it, it's amazing how we intuitively do these things. Hey, um, and that's mm. what I find. Yeah, I've, 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 I've thought about this a lot because, you know, like the humming, you know, this is obviously activating the vagus nerve, um, mm -hmm. which is obviously, you know, activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which is, you know, the rest and digest. So it's going to help bring you back into balance, into that state of calm. And, and, and you're just intuitively doing that from a young age. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like how a lot of, you know, autistic people, you know, we might rock or we might, you know, you know whatever and like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again these are these are things that can bring our bodies back into that parasympathetic nervous system and so yeah I just find I find that really quite fascinating how a lot of us have just d developed that and it's become like our our things that we just do you know um to to self-soothe or to regulate um yeah I I, I that's an interesting subject for me because I do feel that our nervous systems tend to be more sensitive um, to a lot of things. <laughs> and um, I think that, but with that means that we can also be more sensitive to, you know, also what we need, um, mm -hmm. maybe without realizing it. Yeah, there's definitely gifts that come with sensitivity and it's, mm. it's that fine balance of existing as a really sensitive person and all the beautiful things about that and not getting completely overwhelmed yeah and you know there's so much input now compared to what there was even in terms of you know living in the city there's so many electromagnetic frequencies um and there's lots of extra kind of light and sound pollution and just a lot of people and you know the energy that other people emit Give off. All, all their stress all their frustration right all their confusion um this yeah. is another super interesting subject and i know that you know like even autism itself is not you know black and white like it's very you know like you can you know like one autistic person might hate the feel of you know tags in a top and one autistic person might not even notice that they're there you know and I'm the one that doesn't even notice that it's there but you uh, see, well, yeah and I'm like oh, ah, really does. Yeah. yeah um and so it's see it can be like these different extremes right and and mm. I think that this is where a lot of confusion around what autism is comes in as well because it really can be total opposites in 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 a lot of things but um oh I've, I've had a mind blank remind me what we were talking about just how much sensory input there is in the city and oh, all the, yes, yeah, yes. all the, you know, EMFs and things like that. Um, totally. And, it, and yeah, I think, um, so this is something, you know, this is something that I have been for as long as I can remember, obviously now I understand it, but for as long as I can remember, I was like, Ah, oh, like, and you know, there's so many labels that you can put onto it if you want to. I guess ultimately it doesn't really matter. I just am the way that I am. But you know, I know I was like, I always just knew that I was just so sensitive and tuned into like energies around me and things. You know, I would see, I would walk into a room and I could feel, you know, what other people are feeling, or I'd look in someone's eyes and I could feel the depths of their pain or their grief or their suffering or even their joy or whatever it was. Mm. And, I, and I could just feel it so intensely that it's just like, I oftentimes just don't want to be in those situations because it's actually a lot to carry and it's a lot to feel. And, and I never understood this about myself, but then I, but then I found the term like indigo children. I started reading about that. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm an indigo child. Like this makes so much sense. And then it was rainbow children. And then it was um, <laughs> highly sensitive yeah. personality yeah. by Dr. Elaine Aaron. And, mm -hmm. and then all of this, and then ultimately it was, ah, oh, it's autism. <laughs> but um, yeah. So, you know, I, I've gone, I, oh, and then it was, you know, the astrology and I was like, oh, it's because I'm a Sagittarius that I do this. And it's because I'm a, you know, and I, yeah, and I still, yeah. I still am really interested in astrology and I still really believe it, but, um, you know, I just, yeah, it's just interesting. Like my whole life has been a series of like, just trying to understand why I am the way that I am. And it's almost like I would talk, you know, I, I remember from like, 
from such a young age like I must have been about 10 11 and like people adults would tell me well you're so mature for your age and I would just be like I don't I don't understand what that even means and I don't know why they're saying that to me because in my 10 year old little mind I was just like but aren't we just all like that like is is everyone not just like that and I, like what's different about me you know um, and I just I just didn't understand it but then like I guess the older I got the more I started like observing like certain social groups and I'm you know and this is in no way like me being like I'm better than you because I truly and utterly believe that we are all equal but I did start observing and I was like oh, okay well you know I've always been more drawn to like hanging out with older people especially when I was younger like more drawn to like you know certain documentaries or certain research <laughs> that I guess like people of my age just weren't interested in and I don't know this emotional awareness that I had from a really young age that that um seemed to take a lot of adults by surprise I guess um and the ability to articulate what I was thinking and what I was feeling and so, I mean, you know, all of these things, like, you know, I, and I would never have thought, oh, I'm autistic because I just would never have even put those things into the same kind of category. But the more that I've been learning about autism, the more that I've come across more people that are autistic and who also have these experiences, you know, of just being so deeply in tune with everything and, you know, that emotional awareness and the the ability to articulate our thoughts and our feelings very, very clearly. Um, yeah. And then just that dips of processing of just actually everything. Um, yeah. It's really quite eye opening and also just amazing and interesting. It is interesting. It's all different expressions of mm. being very sensitive and having a very highly kind of attuned nervous system and, you know, it's really interesting to look at, you know, the brain scans where they show less kind of less synaptic pruning. So you're literally mm. taking in a lot more information. Um, and then, you know, which is amazing, but then also sometimes really inefficient <laughs> because yeah. it's, 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 and that's where that, that overload comes in. That's because where the overload comes in. And that's lot. also, I think, where where the confusion comes in around the whole topic of is this a disability or is it an ability you know is it a superpower is it is it not um or is it in between like you said and and honestly for me I kind of feel like let's not hide the fact that there are days where I feel totally and utterly disabled like I cannot function as a human being and I can't get out of bed without wanting to cry and pull my hair out and I can't you know, clean my house without wanting to throw myself on the floor and start crying. You know, <laughs> there, there are days where no, like just absolutely not. Does this feel like a superpower? But then there mm. are days where, you know, it does. And so, um, but beyond that, it's like, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you can, you can call it really for me personally either. I just think that it just is yeah. what it is. And that's, mm. and that's what I see it as. It just, it really, really just is what it is. And I think like anything in life, there are, you know, positives and negatives or pros and cons. And I just think that's, that's autism. It's just, it's just that as well. It just is what it is, you know? Um, but yeah, so I guess like, I think that the wording can be damaging because when we do call it a disability and we don't acknowledge the pros, then I think that then people can become quite closed minded to what it actually is and they can become quite even scared of it or, you know, worried that their child might have it or worried, you know, whatever it is, you know, worried to tell, you know, other people that they are themselves autistic or whatever it is because of the stigma around it. But then also when we call it a superpower, we just totally take like it, it totally like, um, what's the word I'm looking for you know it takes away from the very real issues that we can experience as well mm, yeah that's it so when you're trying when you're super sensitive and you're trying to exist in this modern super overwhelming world um that can be a lot and I have um you know throughout my adult life had periods of burnout 
Mm. And sometimes it'd be it would be kind of obvious that it was coming because you know I've been working really hard, maybe I've been studying, that type of thing. And other times it just kind of appears out of nowhere. It's kind of like, oh, well you've been doing too much, so now you're just gonna have to do pretty much nothing, nothing. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about it. <laughs> just stay at home and as you say, you know, cry in the kitchen a bit and like. <laughs> And, and anxious, this is exactly why someone knocks on the door like oh I don't think I can do people today like people I know like <laughs> even just being in someone's presence not even like yeah just being in the presence of another person is just too much right sometimes and I think that um oh I keep having these mind blanks classic um <laughs> you said something really interesting and I was like yeah yeah definitely need to follow on from that but um anyways um mind blank so I'll yeah. just leave that it, thought at that <laughs> it'll it'll circle back around yeah we'll, we'll pick it back up yeah and it is as you were saying before with the sensitivity um and some of us can express it as you say very clearly and it's mm. and in children it can often be seen as really precocious and I one of my one of my kids is like that and he just comes out with these real gems <laughs> sounds like a little old man or you know yeah like, like really insane emotional awareness and he'll just verbalize it and then the, the other is kind of probably more like I was and a lot of the time he's just like it's, everything's internal frozen with it oh yeah or just internally may not may not even be frozen it's just he's not saying anything it's just it's all in there um and sometimes it's so much it's so much sensitivity that you actually have no idea how to express it and and I you know I experience that sometimes not as much now but as a child it was kind of too much and I would I would just you know as you say sometimes just shut down freeze Mm. um and of course you know some autistic people are non-speaking um Mm. and ideally they have people around them who they can communicate with regardless and who will be there and work on developing different ways of communicating that's improving Mm. now as well in terms of you know letter boards and all sorts of different ways and I really think we're, we're evolving towards more telepathy so in some ways, those non-speaking people are probably at the at the forefront of that. But it is it's such a wide array of ways of expressing and communicating. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, there are so many forms of expression. Um, mm, but I think, you know, there are those autistic people that are, you know, non-speaking, non-verbal, you know, for, you know, and have always been. Um, but then I think it's a really also a common experience for those of us um, like you and I who, you know, do speak um, mm-hmm. to also experience moments of going nonverbal. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if this yes. is something that you experience, but it's definitely yeah. something that yeah. I experience. <laughs> um, and it comes when I am just so overwhelmed and burnt mm-hmm. out. Um, and then I, it's like the way I describe it's like it. It's a disconnect like, in the processing. Eh? It's like- yeah and it's like I feel like I physically can't talk like mm-hmm. it's like I can feel like I like if, if someone's trying to talk to me I can feel like I want to like I can feel I can feel like it's like I want to let it out but I can't I can't mm. let it out and this is something you know that has been that has caused issues in the past where people have thought that I'm being rude because yeah. I'm not I'm not talking to, I'm not reciprocating conversation um, and it's not at all that I'm being rude. It's that I am literally having a shutdown. <laughs> and mm. um, now I'm able to recognize that within myself. And, you know, now I have I have used things like writing a text message on my phone to tell the person, hey, I'm, I'm nonverbal right now. And so they're aware of that. And then they can, you know, not take it personally or whatever. 
Um, but yet in the past I didn't, and this is, and this is why the label for me has been so important because it's like, now I can advocate for myself in the past. I would have thought, what's wrong with me? Like, yeah. am I being like <laughs> stubborn or, you know, because everyone's telling me that I'm being rude. So am I being rude? Is that what I'm doing? Like, I don't feel like I am. No, I just feel like I can't talk mm. <laughs> and I don't know mm-hmm. why this is manifesting, but it is, I just can't talk. Um, and so now I can advocate for myself. And I think that, oh, that's just been, it's been really amazing to be able to advocate for myself. Yeah. Mm, yeah, that's so good. Uh, I definitely experienced that as well. Um, mm. Like I said, I was, I was pretty silent a lot of the time as a child. And then yes. as I got older, I would speak a lot more and almost put on a facade of being more social. So sometimes I wouldn't. It would just be acting. Mm. <laughs> um, and, you know, so now I've done years of kind of self-awareness and meditation and I'm much better at recognising what's going on with myself and, you know, processing emotions and mm. all that type of thing. And I still have times where, yeah, that's almost, yeah, my, my throat will actually physically close. close Not, and you, you know, like it does if you're crying. But I don't have to be crying. It's just there's too much, and I and I can't. And you know, for example, my husband knows this now. It's still frustrating for him <laughs> when I can't discuss something with him because I've got. I might not even be upset. It might just be there's so much going on at home up here, and I've had a really overwhelming day with the kids or something. Yeah, and I can't even yeah make those connections and kind of explain <laughs> and he's like I want to help you what can I do and I'm like Bleh. <laughs> <laughs> does that make sense yeah <laughs> absolutely it makes sense it really makes a lot of sense and I think that I hear you about you know because you were saying you know well there are times that we can be like highly you know articulate and express our emotions and you know, in ways that I think some people might even be quite surprised at or, you know, not quite understand even. Um, but then that, yes, there are definitely times where I can't, like I, like you mentioned, you know, where at times where I'm just actually so overwhelmed by it. But for me, it's usually that I can eventually express mm. what it was I was feeling, but it's like but in not, that moment, yeah. mm. I need to internally process whatever it is that I'm thinking. I'm like analyzing it. I'm like, what is this? What's triggered it? Why am I feeling this way? And I'm like really doing all this internal work. And then once I've done that, I can usually be like, oh, this was what I was experiencing. So yeah, I do. I do mm. get that too. Yeah. And sometimes now I have the presence of mind to say, I want to talk about it, but I can't right now. Yeah. <laughs> so that the person isn't just like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And because that can be really hard as well. If it's someone who's close to you, they can feel like you're stonewalling them or, mm. you know, being passive aggressive. And there could be elements of that, but it's more just like, I, I can't do it right now. And I, but I want to, I'll come back to you. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Mm. Mm. When I'm more coherent. Yeah. Mm. One, one experience that I've had with, I think there are actually words that, that names, you know, for what we're, what we're talking about, like this ability to be really hyper aware of our feelings and articulate of them. And then, also a word for not being able to do that. So I think there are, and I can't remember what the words are, but I'm I'm pretty sure I've seen them on my research. Um, <laughs> but one thing that I've also experienced with with the being well, actually with both. So let's let's go with when I'm unable to express what I'm going through and nonverbal. Then I get I'm really rude and inconsiderate of others and all of these other things. Uh, and then on the other hand comments that I've had when I've been like really articulate about how I'm feeling and you know just honest about how I'm feeling and you know very expressive about that and when I am it tends to be quite lengthy because if it's in a message it's long because I need to make sure that everything is exactly how I mean you know and I word it (laughs) like I just like 
this is something you know I've always had so many people just get so annoyed with me at my long text messages so they say it's like I'm sick of your long text messages or and I'm just like but I'm just I don't even know what that like and I still don't even really know what they mean by that because I'm like but I'm just telling you how I feel but anyway um but another thing (laughs) with that is that I'm it's been perceived a lot that I'm being manipulative uh, so when I'm really articulate about how I feel and what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling, what I'm in, what I'm going through, um, it's been received and it's back to me as feedback that I'm being really manipulative um, and like, um, I guess, narcissistic. Yeah, that's a word that I've had come up as well. Um, and it's so triggering to me and... Mm-hmm so painful I can't even begin to describe how how that feels to me because I know that my intention is not to be manipulative or come across as narcissistic and I honestly don't know and still haven't figured out how I can communicate in a way that it doesn't come across like that because I'm just communicating in the only way that I know how in the only way that feels authentic to me and it's almost like the more authentic I am, the more manipulative I seem to others. And that just <laughs> feels really odd to me. And it's something that I can't quite grasp or make sense of. And it just it just hurts me because I, I know who I am, you know, for the most part. And I, I know that for the most part, my intentions are usually good. Mm. Um, and so to, to, to be met with that so often is really confusing to me. And, you know, I'm, I'm always racking my brain like, okay, how should I word this? Or, you know, constantly thinking about how I should word things because I'm just constantly in that kind of, um, in that kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Hyper aware state of just like, this is most likely going to be received in a negative way no matter how I word it and that's been my experience is that I could sit there for weeks months upon end and think about how I should word something and the chances are it's still not going to be right like it's 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 that's that's been a really difficult experience for me I'm curious to know what yours has been around this Mm. I would say I you know I'm like a I'm a recovering fauna slash people pleaser Mm. and so I haven't probably haven't offended too many people except when I was drunk um (laughs) (laughs) I laugh but I yeah I had a fairly serious binge problem in my teens um and so that was you know like move out of the I wasn't humming anymore or or chewing Mm. my hair so I self-medicated in a a much more self-destructive way um, and then you know grew out of that but yeah I was very conflict avoidant and okay. would just kind of let people <laughs> do what they it, wanted have and... it their way because it was much too terrifying for me to yeah to speak out and I'm I'm not like I'm not that way anymore mm. Mm. but I'm quite happy for people not to like me now <laughs> so, that, oh, so that's so that's good so that's the that's the upside not always I mean I, I'm not you know I still get hurt feelings sometimes <laughs> of course you're human right um, but you, you wouldn't say that they're you wouldn't say that you're plagued by it or that it you know affects you you know to extreme degrees or anything yeah no and I and I will say what I I want to say what I think is the truth from my perspective and I'll say it Mm. anyway and I'm always open to changing my mind um and so that's it like you know as you're saying your heart's in the right place if you are expressing yourself and you're coming from your heart from a place of love and understanding that you know other people might see it a different way and Mm. You know, even I might change my mind in a, in a week or two weeks when I get different information, but that's that doesn't reflect my intentions mm. or my my heartfelt um, expression. And so, it is what it is. But you know, it's taken uh, it's taken me nearly forty years to get to that, and it's still a it's still an evolving thing. Yeah. 
and that discernment of when to say something and when to just be like, in this situation, there's nothing I can say that's going <laughs> to be helpful. Mm. Sometimes, yeah. I think that, that this is where, <laughs> this is what I'm having to learn now because like, I've always very much so kind of opposite to you because I've always very much been like, well, if there's an issue, I want us to talk about it. Mm. Um, and so I've always been the one in almost every relationship, you know, with my mother, with friends, with no matter what kind of relationship it is, love, romantic, whatever, in almost every relationship that I've had with people in my life. I've always been the one to really pursue these conversations. Um, and because for me, that's just what feels like the right thing to do. Because mm. for me, I'm like, but we're adults and we can talk about this and we can overcome this. But if we mm. don't, then we can't overcome it. And then it becomes, you know, stale. And then we become resentful and, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so for me, it just feels in my authentic truth to, to bring these topics up and to have these, uh, you know, sometimes really hard conversations with people, mm. but I don't shy away from them. And I never have shied away from them. And I think that this is what I need to learn is um, w when to do that. And I mean, even that feels funny for me to say, cause I'm like, but shouldn't we just all always be doing <laughs> that? But um, this is my black and white thinking, but um, you know, obviously you know time and time again I would say you know the fact that this has not been received well is obviously you know something that I need to pick up on a social cue perhaps um, <laughs> but, um but I do find I do find it difficult because um there's something within me that when something when there's you know some tension or when there's you know something that I don't agree with or you know some kind of incongruency or anything like that just it's like if I if I don't say anything it I feel like it I can I can physically feel like my insides are being <laughs> like I got like just torn apart and it's like it's really hard for me to just sit with not mm. saying anything because I'm like I don't know how to have an authentic relationship with this person if I can't have an authentic conversation with them like that's how it feels for me mm. but I think for a lot of people in my life it's been I don't want to have this conversation I don't think it's necessary or even important and the fact that you're I guess I've been told baiting or whatever the fact that you're trying to have this conversation <laughs> with me is actually really annoying and um you know, it, it's, it's pushed a lot of people away in my life. Um, and I just, you know, I, I find it interesting because, you know, through the autism diagnosis, I've obviously connected with a lot of other autistic people. And it seems that, you know, there are a lot of other autistic people that have had really similar experiences to me yeah. in, in this kind of way of, you know, um, people just really misinterpreting our meaning and, um, thinking that we're trying to start something that we're not or thinking that we're being you know um staring the pot <laughs> yeah staring the pot um you know creating problems and I'm just like curious because I don't feel like I'm creating a problem I feel like I'm talking about the problem that's there that we're all ignoring um <laughs> and so I don't but but then but then you know because people aren't necessarily always ready to acknowledge it or mm. ever ready necessarily to acknowledge it then then I feel like the projection gets put onto me because it's like, oh, you're the problem. And it's like, no, I'm just talking about the problem that we're all ignoring right now. Um, mm -hmm. But then I, but then, you know, and I'm able to, I'm able to reflect back now and see and understand that. But in the past, it's always been, I'm the problem. I'm, I'm, I'm the, I'm the, you know, I'm the one creating all of these issues and I've very much been a scapegoat my whole life. So um mm. Yeah, that's that's been a really tough one to navigate. Um, and I would say it's probably my deepest, one of my deepest wounds um, from being undiagnosed neurodivergent. Yeah, mm. definitely. Um, yeah, I, I think that is a common experience. And then I suppose that, you know, the great thing about being an adult is then you can more and more choose who the people are that you spend yeah. more of your time with so that you can have conversations yeah this is and it. then in terms of you know 
the other people out there in the world, you know, there could be situations where you feel like it's really important to tell tell the truth, sort of thing. And there'll be <laughs> other there'll be there'll be other situations where those that those people aren't close to you, and you might you'll just be wasting your energy if you try and yeah. communicate with them. But you know, in terms of your intimate relationships, like it is really important to have those conversations, and it's a, it's a really great skill. And it's I think to, this to is why I've been forward. so confused because for me, I'm like, should we not all be doing this? And yet I'm doing it. And by no means do I think I'm better than anyone because yet this is an area in which I feel like I am good at, but then it's <laughs> never received well. <laughs> but I feel like that, you know, there's obviously areas that I'm terrible at as well. So in no way means, I, I always have this need to clarify that I'm not a know-it-all or I don't think highly of myself because that's another thing I've been told a lot in my life. Um, <laughs> so it, it's not coming from that place. Um, but it, But yeah, I just think, but should we not all be taught how to communicate like this? Like, is that just not what we should all be doing as, adults but I think what I've learned is that it's not so much necessary because it, ha it it can't be I mean I've tried a million and one different ways of communicating I've done letters I've done face-to-face -face, I've done phone calls <laughs> I've done texts I've like reworded my things a million and one times and it's always you know no that didn't work that didn't work that didn't work so I don't think it's so much the content of what I'm saying necessarily I think it's the fact that what I'm saying should just not be said. And I think that's maybe the kind of understanding that I've come to these days or had to have come to because it's like, I've been analyzing for so long, like what is it about what I'm doing and saying that's really annoying these people I don't understand. Maybe it's just the fact that this is not a conversation that we should have. Maybe maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's just, <laughs> maybe it's a no-go zone and I didn't pick up on that social cue apparently. <laughs> Well, everyone's got different things they would do and don't want to talk about, right? And mm. so, um, you said, I think we will always we will evolve collectively towards this place of much greater transparency and mm. um, honesty and and all these things. But as you said, not everyone's ready, and so why kind of waste your energy on people who <laughs> aren't willing to receive? <laughs> but you know, it's just. How do you discern that? It's not always easy. So. It's it's like when I'm hearing you say that, it's like I can feel it inside my stomach. Like it's always like I've bubbling. It's like, but to. I have to. Yeah, it's that sense to. of justice for me. And it's the, like, the, again, like the honesty thing that you say. And like, if I, if I, if it's I, like, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying they, you know, it, you might just be wasting your time. Oh, no. And I think <laughs> yeah, you're totally yeah. right. And, and this is the hardest lesson for me. And because I totally <laughs> agree with what you're saying, I really do think that I need to, learn when to take a step back and when to just be with myself and sit through those emotions and those uncomfortable feelings and self-regulate and be like look this is not an ideal situation for me but it's not going to be ideal it's going to be even worse if I pursue it so you know this person's not ready to receive it just accept mm. it and move on and that's a really hard lesson for me because honestly like it's like I can feel everything bubbling up inside me of just like no it can't be that way because it's not fair <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it has to be and and yeah it's a hard lesson mm. yeah and and the way you're describing it it's like I can actually physically see my children having that internal experience very mm. obviously because you know they're young and and they express it very transparently and and they're yes. safe too which is a good thing they don't have to jam it all in. It's a beautiful thing. Um, but yeah, and, and we try and teach them that sometimes it's best just to, to walk away until the energy <laughs> settles down and they, they have such a hard time doing it. <laughs> and that is completely fair because most of us as adults struggle with this also. It's, yeah, that's it's right. Like, don't, it's not like you have to not have the feeling or not have the conversation, but actually maybe if you wait 10 minutes, it's going to be so much better. <laughs> and then the issue might have actually subsided and I'm not talking about you know big world issues I'm talking about you know like sibling conflict that type of thing mm -mm -mm. Yes, but it's yes, like yes. a small scale version yeah I hear you <laughs> I hear you that is an interesting observation to make yeah. Mm. yeah 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 so we probably should wrap up soon 9 30 oh my gosh it's yeah. really one of those things that's like 
like see so we've been on this I guess for like an hour doing this and it just has gone so quickly and I just feel like ah there's so much more to talk about and yeah I'm just but, happy that we're is. doing this yeah and, so and that we can got keep doing this um, lots of topics we've got lots of topics so we can yay. we'll be picking some and some of them will be you know maybe controversial some of them will just be <laughs> things that are things that are interesting so, love a bit of controversy <laughs> yeah I gotta love a bit of controversy so yeah and if and if you're listening and you want to communicate with us you know that, that's Yay. welcome and also if you think actually I'd really love to come on to the Great, great Awakening Generator that would be so show cool. about neurodiversity and you want to mm-hmm. speak with us um just yeah, encourage you to to get in touch. Soraya is a bit scary, but I'm not. <laughs> I just, I just, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> I will send you a long text about my feelings. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm totally just taking the piss. But yeah, see, look, we have senses of humor. We're very fun. <laughs> thanks Kirsty. this is amazing I'm so excited about it and um yeah I best we uh better wrap up for the night but um see you guys again soon hey yeah thanks so much for sharing and we'll talk soon thanks Kirsty. take care <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs>